Welcome to the first and ever APT Tilt System Lecture. As I, as I said, we only put the lecture together over the last week. Um, and normally, as you might have gathered, I do a talk on the whole project, which comes in three lengths. The one and a half hour, the two and a half hour, and the, oh my God, is he ever going to stop? Um, I've only done the third one twice in my life. And it started off at half past seven on one of them and finished at ten past one in the morning. So just go, tend to go on a bit. But this one's specifically about tilt systems because they're quite radically different as, as the system developed in its time. And as you can see by my badge, I just might have had something to do with it. So to establish my bona fides in the case, you'll, most of you will know this photograph of APT, which BR published and tells us we're going to go 150 miles an hour on the test track at Old Dorby, complete load of cobblers, it was standing still. <laughs> and because that's me in the cab there. And to prove it's me in the cab, I've got a photograph of the guys taking this photograph. And there it is. <laughs> <laughs> so obviously it wasn't going anywhere, because otherwise they... And interestingly, they, they said this, the train, as you'll learn later, tilts over at nine degrees. And they said, well, can't you tilt it any more? We said, well, no, it wouldn't do that. They said, well, it doesn't look as if it's tilted. I said, well, you know, what more do you want? So we actually tilted it right onto its mechanical bump stops, which was 12 degrees in that photograph. Somebody actually measured it once and emailed me and said, but this wasn't nine degrees, it was 12 degrees. I said, yeah, I know, I know. But anyway, tilt systems. <coughs> People have been using tilting trains back into the 1930s, but they were what's called um, passive tilt. That is, the, the vehicles pivoted right at the top with the weight low down so that it swung outwards on a curve. The trouble is that that's very slow response rate and it doesn't give you any advantage about going around a curve in a tearing hurry until quite late in the game. The idea for APT, and this obviously is E-Train, sorry, I tend to call them E-Train and P-Train rather than APTE and APTP because it takes less time to talk about it. E-Train was designed to be powered tilt, that is hydraulics physically moved it out round and pushed it back to the place where it was meant to be. And that's the philosophy that BR followed all through the APT project. And in fact, similar philosophy holds good even today. Super Voyagers, the ones that are actually tilting, use hydraulic tilt systems with APTP type tilt systems on them. So you can experience the APTP ride on the Super Voyager. Um, we started the work at the Technical Centre in 19, late 1970. This is in the APD lab, and this is the... This box of tricks here is the tilt rig, which was, um, we called it the coffin for obvious reasons. It's this great big mass pivoted along here with weights inside it to simulate half um, a power car or a trailer car. And we ran the system from this control room up here. And um, I'm afraid that lunatic working the crane there is me. Um, that's the bottom of the tilt rig. The, these are the APT E-type tilt jacks. And this spiral of pipe there was to simulate the length of the train, the length, because they were, the, the hydraulic power packs were always 30 feet away or so from the, from the actual tilt jacks themselves. And you can see it's there in more detail. The control valves are back there somewhere just out of view. But they, we used on E-Train, we used the same tilt jacks for the power cars and the trailer car. They were always the same, unlike the P-Train outside, which is slightly different. Um, that's the sort of arrangement it worked on E-Train. The, the pivot here, the actual pivot, this bolster was on swing links from the bogey frames alongside, so that as the train tilted over, its own mass moved the bolster across on the swing link, so the, the virtual pivot was in the middle. Anybody got the phone? <laughs> um, that, that pivot point is designed to be at the height of your hips when you're sitting down which automatically gave you a tough time if you were standing up because your, your sensors were up here somewhere. The, 
accelerometers that measured the sideways force of the train. There was one at the top there, and one at the bottom. That worked through the electronics and the tilt jacks, as you can see, they were vertically mounted. And obviously on one side, one pushed and the other pulled. And there were two at one end and two at the other end. And we first ran this on this weird Bailey Bridge on Wheels called Pop Train. Pop Train was basically an APTE power car with ballast weights in place. You can see the ballast weights there and there. And used APT bogies, in this case the very early swinging arm bogies. And this little cabin thing in the middle had the tilt packs and the HK brake packs and the, in those days, vertical suspension packs which were also hydraulic. And we rode about on those things all over the country on West Coast Mainline, East Coast Mainline, quite often standing outside. Because if, if the train was going that way, you could stand on the downwind side and the outside and have a wonderful view of the scenery. Did it once at 135 miles an hour going down Betok, great fun. Um, this is a swinging arm bogey stood on the end of pop train. This bit here, that's where the tilt jacks went into, that little framework there. And you can see them going into this on the swinging arm bogey. This is as we were building pop train. This thing's the, the handling dolly which they used to jack it up and down with. We still, still use those up at Shildon to jack E-Train around. And there you can see Power Car 3 standing upright there and you see the tilt jacks in the normal position, whereas Power Car 4 was right over on the bump stops. That's right over to 12 degrees. Normally the electronics tilted it to 9 degrees and it did that in one second. In those days it only did it once because it ran out of hydraulic power very quickly. Um, but that's right over on the bump stops and the, the tilt jacks have got rubber bungs in the bottom about so thick so that it didn't go crash when it hit the bump stops. Uh, yes, that's in Peterborough. We can't, I shan't tell you the Peterborough. Shall I tell you the Peterborough story? Shall I tell the Peterborough story? Yes. <laughs> East Coast Main Line, Peterborough. Wait, we had a 47 that was geared for 110 miles an hour. And in those days, they used to run the Deltics along in... Go on. Sh <laughs> Keep going. But they used to run the Deltics in flights of four or five trains, and there was a gap to get freights in. So what we'd do is wait until the first Deltic of a flight was about to enter the station, and then we'd go, which gave us a lot of space before we ran into a signal stops run to the back of the train. So um, Lab Coach 3 was down there, and we were getting ready to go this and I was in lab coach three uh, getting the thing set up and uh, started to go back down the corridor lab coach three had got two compartments at one end and an open saloon for the rest of it I was walking down the corridor there was a guy coming the other way with a suitcase <laughs> I said and he hadn't got the security badge on he said excuse me can I help you? he said he said I'm looking for a compartment I said are you BR staff he said no no I'm a passenger I said, this train's not, he said, oh, they said it was going to Newcastle. I said, really, but it is, but it's a test train, you can't travel. I mean, Lab Coach 3 was painted as, where the grey panel was, was bright, bright red. And it had got Lab Laboratory Coach 3 on the side. Well, not exactly unsubtle. So I said, sorry, you can't travel on this train. You know, your train goes from that platform over there in about 10 minutes. Oh, but he said this one would get here first. I said, yes, it would, but it's not a passenger train. <laughs> so anyway. At that point, Malcolm Wilson called me back and he said, can you balance these off? Oh, okay, so I went back, fondly thinking this guy had disappeared. So we finished the work and I went back, came round the corner to the end of Pop Train as if I was coming out here. And there's the bloke standing here in the middle of the Pop Train with the suitcase. What? I said, <laughs> yeah, he'd stepped across the gap and walked down here. I said, excuse me, you're not allowed to travel. Oh, but they still said, that I thought I'd go and have a look in that compartment down there, pointing to this. I said, please get off the train. And he started to give the words, oh, that's stuff this. So I put my head set into the plug there and said to Trevor, I said, Trevor, give me positive, full positive tilt, power car three and power car four. Trevor said, sorry? I said, just do it. So we, <laughs> we, the guy came past me doing about a thousand miles an hour. And the guy from the local paper took this photograph exactly at the right moment. Yes. Sorry, you remembered now. Sorry, that was, that's the Peterborough story. Um, in those days, we used what 
we then called the Mark I tilt pack. And this is the only known photograph of a Mark I tilt pack for good reasons, because it was useless. Um, sorry, I didn't say that. Um, it was originally designed by Hawker Sidley. Not quite sure why, because they wouldn't talk to us. Um, and you see it's relatively small. It's got a very large accumulator there and a relatively small pump, a small motor. And that's the tank, nowhere near big enough. And testing pop train at Old Dorby, we found um, if we had any instability in the bogey, the bogey would, would hunt backwards and forwards, and then the tilt system would try and compensate for that, and it would run out of oil after probably four or five cycles. Look, no oil, and then it would fall over. So we decided to... We sp tried to speak to Hawker Sidley, failed abysmally. So redesigned this thing completely into what became known as the Mark II tilt pack. And you can just see it down there. That's the tank. This is taken in power car three at old, uh, power car two at Old Dorby. Um, big accumulators. The same pump, we ran it at double the speed. Um, you can see it's quite a complex thing. The only bit left over is that, that valve block in the middle there. That valve block holds the two control valves, which send the oil out to the two different systems, and a changeover valve that decides which one's working. And it, in the power car, they're sitting out here in the breeze, whereas in the trailer cars, they're under this socking great cover. And quite deliberately on the two APTE trailer cars, they're above the floor, so we, if anything went wrong, which it did frequently, we could get to it. And you can see there, the uh, lives in this big case. That front bit comes off completely, but it looks exactly the same. Oh, the electronic box of tricks on the top isn't the tilt control box. That's the HK brake control box. It was just a handy place to put it. That's the tilt control box. I mean, it's about that big, pretty tiny. Any of you electronics or electrical engineers? <laughs> Jolly good, because it's fairly crude to say the least. And from that control box in the trailer car two, we could control, turn the tilt systems on on all four vehicles, um, which made it kind of difficult if you were got them separated because you couldn't start the power car tilt packs at all unless you've got this hooked up. So that was my usual place of work for four or five years. You can see there with the, the tilt tracks on the trailer car, it's fully extended there so that's tilted over. This was actually taken inside the NRM in the um, early 1980s when that was on the show. This is all a bit technical but the way the control system worked the accelerometers here and here, and there were four of them uh, in two independent channels, channel one and channel two. And one lot fed into this amplifier, the other lot fed into that amplifier. They both read separate servo valves, and only there did they decide which one was doing any work. And you could either switch it manually, switch it from one to the other, or this box of tricks here, which is a, called the monitor accelerometer, which was overlooking worked another set of amplifiers that if all else failed it would switch itself and a few times that went horrendously wrong. We were sitting at Trent Junction once and Tony Hobbs, my boss, said um, we seem to have got some vibration going on channel one and I said okay we're going to switch over to channel two so I leant over and switched the manual switch for this and the thing immediately went right over and it bump stuff whoop, because channel two had already failed but I didn't know that. So we're sitting there like this with the train about to go we'd actually got the green and the inspector was trying to go we couldn't go because it said tilt failure so Tony said we'd better switch it back again see what we can do so switched it back to channel one but that wasn't working all that well so I controlled it manually with a get the right that little slot down there could actually control the tilt with a manually with a little tiny screwdriver. So I'm standing sideways on this, working this screwdriver while the train's going along all the way from Trent Junction to Leicester. Great fun. On E-Train, these blue points are where the tilt packs were, pretty much in the middle of the train. The accelerometers are also in the middle of each vehicle, pretty close. And the tilt jacks obviously were at the ends over the bogies, which differs quite considerably from the P train, as you can see as we'll go through. And as I said, quite obviously the tilt packs were above the floor so we could get at them when we quite frequently had to. 
Um, I can't remember why that one's there now. Oh, I know. To say. Show your hair <laughs> <laughs> yes. I had lots of hair then. Uh, that, that was. Bec I was going to talk about the. Um, oops, sorry. The 12 degrees tilt in that position, but normally it only moved backwards and forwards, plus and minus nine degrees, which is what the P trains did. Um, didn't have to be tilting on the high speed runs on the western region 150 miles an hour you can see here going through sonning cutting the power cars are obviously not tilting whereas the trailer cars are that wasn't because um, we just felt like it the, the aerodynamics guys said that there was a very slight aerodynamic advantage in the power cars not tilting because because they were cutting through the air relative to the ground at the same angle as the track there was a chance that um, they wouldn't generate any vortices so we did that but also we found at Old Dalby that the brackets for the tilt jacks on here were not as strong as they might have been and we needed to get them at full rating for the London to Lesser run which we did in an hour um, so we ran without them there and then put new brackets on we also had to test the failure case that is if the tilt system decided not to work at all so we did some tests at Old Dolby with trailer car one here tilted in the wrong direction so you can see here trailer car two going around cranked over nicely to nine degrees that's trailer car one there tilted to 12 degrees in the wrong direction so it was sort of 20 plus degrees outwards because you couldn't switch it remotely somebody had to be sitting on the train and switch it over to channel 2 channel 2 was already set up to tilt it in the wrong direction so needless to say that somebody was me Tony Hobbs said somebody you know we need somebody who knows what they're doing Kip. Said, yeah fine so I'm traveling around upper Broadlands 120 degrees like this not the most fun arrangement um, we used to run into a lot of problems and this ginormous tilt rig here which you compared with one later on was a flushing trolley which um, cleaned out all the hydraulic hose we found that one of the prime causes of failure of it going to go like that was the servo control valves had got very very small holes in I'm talking about 12 15 microns across that's a millionth of a millimeter it's not very big at all and dirt could get plugged into this thing and if that got in there the valve would fail and that would happen not a good idea if you're a passenger sitting on it drinking your coffee and all of a sudden it went Bleep. so we spent a considerable amount of time in filtering the oil and um, one way or another I've become a, a middle level sort of expert on dirt in hydraulic oil we're talking about dirt you can't even see if you look it up in a test tube of this stuff you can't see the dirt there you need to look at it through a microscope so this um, this is a drum of ordinary conventional drum of oil which is okay for JCBs you can pour it in off a bucket but you can't do that on e-train so we we filtered it all through this rig first and then pumped it into the train already clean as clean as ever been then we would take samples of it that's the box the sample thing down there we take samples and look at them under the microscope to make sure it was good and clean which it got pretty good and they use a similar technique on P train as well so because of the problems with falling over they decided that the passenger carrying train P train would not fail um, and you can see here the diagram there's E train with its vertical tilt jacks P train was arranged in this fashion much bigger diagram here because of the same sort of tilt swing links same tilt center the same height in the same place but the tilt jacks were horizontal much longer stroke of course and because they used much more effort to push the train over they had to be larger diameter um, but the idea was that if all else failed you could yank the uh, valves open so that you connect one tilt jack to the other tilt jack so there was no effort and then the train would pendle them back to to the horizontal so that the floor was leveled with the track and in fact the P trains fitted up with some um, ratchets inside so that when the train came back to that position they could pull this actuator which locked it into that position 
which they did in service a few times. So that meant that a lot of the work that we'd done, and I'm purely talking about tilt system, needed to be reassessed. So come on you, work. There we are. Um, again, the virtual pivot was in the same place, the tilt actor here, but the control system is completely different. The accelerometer was actually on the bogey frame itself, so still measured the same sideways force, but because it wasn't mounted in the body, it didn't come back to zero when it tilted. So instead, they had this thing here called an LVDT, which stands for Linear Variable Differential Transducer. Gosh, isn't that wonderful? Um, which measures the angle of the train, and then they compare the two together. So it had the same sort of arrangement. So it, it knew where it was meant to go, it knew where it was, and it compared the two together. Obviously, that means a completely new design of bogey. And we used this coach here as a, as a test vehicle for it. This is Lab Coach 4 Hastings, which actually was a buffet car from the Hither Green disaster. And it was lurking around. We knew it existed and couldn't find it. And then one day, one of the other guys in the project and myself, we were on a train going through Mitchell Diva, going down to see some um, suppliers in Southampton. And Dave suddenly yelled, there's a Hastings coach as we came into Mitchell Diva station. So we hurled ourselves off the train. Obviously, we were late for the appointment. And um, we went into the Mitchell Diva yard, which in those days was vast. Hundreds of wagons and all sorts of things. Conned our way past the yard master and said, you know, we're looking for this Hastings coach. Oh, yes, he said, that's the paint store. I said, oh, right. So we went to find it. Dave climbed up the side and opened the double doors and about 150 tins of paint went boom. <laughs> And he's lying on the ground there, completely <laughs> surrounded. Luckily, none of them opened. So anyway, we, we pinched Hastings coach for the tech centre. And it was set up so that this end of it was um, a laboratory vehicle with instrumentation. The middle bit with those two big windows was a VIP compartment with uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight seats in it and air conditioning, double glazed windows. It had carpet on the walls even. To this day, it looks pretty darn good in there. And then the other end had got the tilt pack. Now, this is a completely different tilt pack, so this was called the Mark III tilt pack. And we used it for two purposes. One, to prove the, the system that was going to go on P-Train, and two, to test components. It was made so you could unbolt stuff. We could use two or three different pumps and filters and valves and stuff like that. There were only ever two Mark III tilt packs. And the bogey that they used was this thing here called H4X. This bit is the outer bogey frame. And that bit in the middle is the bolster and there's the, an air spring on top of it. So that little blomp in the end is the end of the tilt jack. So it's pushing away from you. So the whole of this bit swings up and down. But the rest of it bears a lot of resemblance to the E-train bogeys. It uses the same springs, dampers and all that sort of stuff. And you see Hastings coach. Originally, Hastings coach was built like this with accelerometers in the same place, just like E-Train was. Um, but later, and you see tilt jacks here, the tilt pack was there. Later on, as the project developed, that was moved down onto the bolster, onto the bogey frame, like the P-Train. So there's quite a lot of development work done on Hastings coach. And it's a very significant vehicle. Unfortunately, I think there's a short list of about five of us who really understand that, but never mind. You can see, and this is it tilted over. Hastings coach should only tilt at six degrees. And the reason we used a Hastings coach was that the Hastings line had got a very small tunnel. So the vehicles on that train were vertical sided, ordinary Mark I coach with vertical sides, no curves. So it could tilt to six degrees before it ran into the, into the gauge. And that's just down the road. That's a sandbatch station just away from here. We did most of our tests on the line from here to Longsite in Manchester because that line goes over the Cheshire salt mines and it was never the same two days in succession. There was about a 60 mile an hour speed limit on it and um, back in those days of course because they were still mining it and we, we were cleared for 75 but it was random. The, the way the track went was very random which was just what we needed to test it. We couldn't, you couldn't do a test run on one day and say compare it to a test run on another day because the track was different. And that's the one I was talking about, the 
That's the bridge under Old Dolby, and that's tilted to six, so you can see it's just clear there. <coughs> Later on, in order to, because Hastings coach had only got bogies at either end, we couldn't test the articulated bogey because there wasn't any articulation. They rebuilt Pop Train with an articulated APTP bogey in the middle, which was, I remember the numbers, a BT12? BT12, is it? Somebody? Oh, right, thank you. And then these was the ones at the outboard ends, BT11s, were sort of GT turbo versions of the H4X bogies under Pop Train, but they also had sideways tilt jacks. Somebody took the opportunity to put skins over the outside of pop train thus spoiling it for the operators because you couldn't ride on the outside <laughs> very bad idea um, power car 3 had the prototype trailer car tilt pack underneath it which we call the mark 5 logically enough you may wonder what happened to the mark 4 that comes later it's on for the, it's for the power cars so th the object of the exercise with these which was much more compact was it was sitting underneath the floor. I tell you, you do not want to sit next door to a Mark II tilt pack with a pump going because it's bloody noisy. Um, so the Mark V used the same pack, but it was under the floor and soundproofed, and it was designed so it was you could quickly disconnect it, both electrically and hydraulically. Put a forklift truck underneath like this and yank it out. So Power Car Three operated with both a Mark V underneath and a Mark II on top and we could switch it from one to the other. And the Mark Vs are pretty good. They, later on they were modified slightly for the P-trains but pretty much they were exactly the same. Um, the electronics is on the, on the pack rather than up in the vehicle. And the very first P-train trailer car which was called Lab 8 Pilot, that one in the middle there, that was inserted into the pop train that popped two with the two articulated bows under it, and that did lots and lots of miles. The Mark IV pack was for the power cars, of, and of course that was above the floor, it didn't need to be underneath because it got no passengers. So to test that, we made this monster, which was called a Trestrol for obvious reasons, because it was a Trestrol wagon, but shifted two feet above the ground. And this was used to test quite a lot of things, as well as the P-Train power car tilt system. It was used to test the, um, the sp coil spring uh, secondary suspension. And you can't see it from there, but it's got the proper gearbox and the carton shaft and the motor. The traction motors for the P-Trains are up inside the body here. And this gubbins along the side is to make sure that the pantograph didn't tilt. Obviously, if you've got a power car that's knotting along at umpteen hundred miles an hour and it tilts over like that and the pantograph comes off the wire, it's probably not such a good idea. <laughs> um, see, we even tested Trestrol under the bridge, which was, um, and I believe I'm the only human being to ever travelled inside that thing while it was going, because when we moved it out to Old Dorby, they said somebody ought to travel in it and I, I got to be volunteered and sitting in there at a norm, normal kitchen seat like this, with this drive shaft about that diameter whizzing around this far from your ear is not too much fun. So I suggested afterwards that perhaps people in there was not a good, good scheme. Then we come to the real thing, yep. APTP. Um, in this case it's a, a 2 plus, one, two, three, four, probably 2 plus 6, early days obviously because it's got a yellow front. And here we have the various bogies. That's a non-articulated bogey at the front, and this has got an air spring bolster, air springs there, and the tilt jacks running under here. And the, uh, the tilt sensor sits on the frame about there somewhere. Then the, the articulated bogey's got two tilting bolsters, one under each end, one here and one here outboard of the wheels which actually turned out to be not such a good idea dynamically but it's the same same tilt jacks under here and once again the um, the accelerometers are on the bogey frame and the BP17 that's the power bogey with the, the gearbox here doesn't have the carbon shafts in it but the tilt jacks here which are not only larger diameter but they're longer stroke um, because 
the thing may weighs a lot more and needs to be heaved about a bit more. And you can see the differences in the trailer cars, how they, they tilt over. And there's the anti-tilt pantograph doing its thing. All this mechanism up here, making sure that the pantograph goes in the opposite direction to the body. Surprisingly, that worked perfectly, straight away. There was never any problem with it. Which is probably a good thing, because if, the, if it had come off the wire, it would have been... Uh, great fun. And the, on the P-train everything was in a different place. This is a very complicated diagram I'm afraid. You see the tilt packs there underneath the floor here and here but in the power car above the floor. The accelerometers are on the bogey frames and the tilt jacks are in the same place. But early on in the test program that's how they ran it. Pretty much like that but it was found that it was much more sensible to tilt this vehicle, the assuming the train is going from right to left, to tilt this vehicle it made more sense to use the tilt signal from that vehicle. So this accelerometer on this one was fed into the control system here and that made the life for the passengers in the second vehicle much better. Actually that works exactly the same on a Pendolino. The tilt environment on a Pendolino is much better in the seconds coach along rather than the front one, so don't ever travel in the front. Um, and of course the guy who has the worst tilt environment is the poor old driver because he's even ahead of the sensor. He has got... Uh, but then he's paid for being there rather than having to pay for the privilege himself. And as you may see this afternoon um, Tilting these things manually is quite possible. We've done it in recent months on the end driving van trailer down here and hopefully I'll be able to do it later on this afternoon. Um, where's Brian? Oh, he's not here. Brian seems to think we can do it in the power car as well. The only trouble is doing it in the power car is you've got to stand in it to do it, which isn't much fun. Anyway. Oh, yes. This is... Remember me turn that giant flushing trolley thing that we had on E-Train? This is the production version. They built this, they built about a dozen of these to run at Shields Depot. And it's got the flushing pump and the valves and all that, complete with the microscope and all that sort of stuff. And oh, I wish we had one of those now. It's a wonderful piece of kit. Works really well. There we have it. There's a, a quick resume of um, APT tilt systems.